Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. The Lord is good and his mercies endure it forever. You are tuned in to Pentecost R and this is your brother and friend Amos Kevin Annan. We want to discuss reflecting and recasting visions concerning family life and health. It is a very important part of our human endeavor, the family. As we all know, it is the fulcrum on which hangs everything in our society. And so as the family goes, so does society go. As the family goes, so does the church go. You are not going to have a strong church until you have strong families. And these strong families might have strong individuals. And we can only have strong individuals when they come broken. That's the mystery of Christianity. Your strength is in your brokenness. It's not in your competence. It's in you coming knowing that you are an entity. You are nothing before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And he takes your life that is not deserving of anything and transforms it into something that he alone can boast about. That is why anyone who comes before God cannot boast in their credentials because all our credentials must fall at his feet. Not at his loin, at his feet. May God be gracious unto us. Well, managing conflicts. Can we ever finish fighting? <laughs> Can we ever finish fighting? Would conflicts ever cease being part of human endeavor? Well, the Soweto boys in South Africa put together a beautiful song, Lord, make us instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let your love increase. Where there is pride and prejudice shall cease. When we are instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, we will show his love. Where there is injury, we will never judge. Where there is striving, we shall speak his peace. To millions crying for release, we will be his instrument of peace. Where there is blindness, we shall pray for sight. Where there is darkness, we shall shine his light. And where there is sadness, we will bear their grief to the millions crying for relief where we will be instrument of peace. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this moment of grace. We are all products of your grace and therefore we are mindful that nothing of ours have we accomplished except that which was given us. And as we speak to the subject of managing family conflicts, these feuds may have been with us generations. Others have been recent phenomenon. Others we cannot tell when they will emerge. But whatever it may be, we know that it is well. For all things work together for our good, because we are called according to your purpose, and we do love you. Be gracious to us this morning. In Christ Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, I was checking out the meanings of manage, family, on conflict and I got some interesting discoveries. Life is all about discoveries. We're seeking to manage family conflicts and some of us may be dealing with conflicts that predate us, predate us. Sometimes in marriage and family life you find people fighting their father's battles and finish agenda and that cascades into their marriages and whilst within the marriage they are fighting the shadows of their father fighting the shadows of their mother or grandparent. Some of them they might not have even had close encounter with. Sometimes the conflicts are something we ourselves have engineered. And sometimes the conflicts we cannot be able to diagnose properly to determine where it had come from. The first time I was invited to speak to the issue of conflict in a general sense of not dealing with it at individual levels but at the corporate body of church members was at Zoe Temple where I was asked to speak to the subject of creatively handling conflict. But today is about managing family conflict. Well, manage, to handle or direct with degree of skill, mm. to treat with care, to exercise executive, administrative or supervisory direction. That's very interesting. I remember Koko Hatchful speaking to us on time management many years ago. He said the planned and controlled use of time. Is time management by putting together the resources of controls that eliminate time wasters 
in order to be able to optimize the time available to achieve expected ends. And so we've got to plan and we've got to control. So in management, there's both the planning aspect and there's the control mechanisms that we put in place. Okay, that presupposes that conflict would arise. Family. In the context of human society, a family deriving from Latin word familia, a group of people affiliated by a very strange word that they put there. It says consanguinity. Simply means recognized by birth. <laughs> An affinity by marriage or co-residence or shared consummation or consumption, that is kinship. Members of the immediate family include spouses, parents, brothers, sisters, sons, and or daughters. Members of the extended family may include grandparents, aunties, uncles, cousins, nephews, nieces, and siblings who are also in-laws. However, this focus is going to be on the nuclear one, the small unit. Because if we are to deal with conflict that arises in the broader sense of family, we won't live here. As a basic unit for raising children, five different kinds of families have been identified. First is what they call matrifocal. This is where a mother and a child or children live together. What many will call single parent home is also a nuclear one. Conflicts could arise. There is a conjugal where there is a husband, wife, children, and also sometimes referred broadly as nuclear family. Many people, when they say nuclear, this is the one they're talking about. There's also patrifocal, which is where father only exists with the child or children. Then there is what they call the evangular, for example, where grandparents, and many, many homes in Ghana, we have grandparents living with the children. Grandparents, a brother or sister, and their children or child are living with yours. And some of us may have had those experiences before. And this is where favoritism sometimes comes. They get two portions of meat and you get one portion of meat and you are crying. But today we are told, take less meat. So it means that you are being prepared for a good life. <laughs> Little did you know. <laughs> then we have the extended family where parents, children co-reside with others who may or may not be related by blood, okay? Then there's the blended family. That's a new one. That's the most recent one, blended family. You have all kinds of uh, blend, a uh, blend. You know the blender. You blend. You blend different categories. And some, one child was brought from somewhere, another from somewhere. Someone was adapted. Somebody was integrated. Others were grafted. You know, all kinds of, it's a blend. Just take it like that. <laughs> Conflict will arise when people are jostling for power, control, and to assert themselves within a small space. And oftentimes in a trotro, when one seat is available, you see two people jostle each other. That's a form of conflict. It's not as volatile as some conflicts where somebody will smash a screen. Four years ago, I sat with a young man. Those were the days people have started buying flat screens in some places. Very prominent individual. And he got so infuriated with the wife because they were trying to watch two channels. And that little dispute, the young man got infuriated because he couldn't watch his favorite soccer team. In his anger, he just threw the remote and then he hit the screen. Psh, smashed it from the top down. You know the LCD. He's gone bonkers. In Kenya recently, we were reviewing articles of women who are having some mistrust of their husbands. Practicing infidelity, and these women decided to clip off their genitalia just to teach them a lesson. And that was happening recurringly. And so a gentleman sat down and said, let's come with a very ingenious way of protecting men. So he came with the undergarment, which was metal. And so he has a padlock. And when a man is going to sleep, if you know you're a candidate of infidelity, you have to put on this metal casket. And then you zip it with a paddle of bum. And his caution is that be sure your wife doesn't know where you keep the key. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, conflict is something that is very common, rife, within church and outside church. Sometimes people delude themselves into thinking, oh, once the brother speaks in tongues, once the sister speaks in tongues, they are such an angelic being. And so we date. I like to talk a lot about dating. And singles like dating, going out, 
But my question has always been, can you go out without getting in? In Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse 14, we read these encouraging words. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome, and fight for your families, your sons, and your daughters, your wives, and your homes. What do we see in our world today? Instead of people fighting for their families, they are fighting the families. And Nehemiah was confronted with the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. And we are also today confronted with rebuilding our marriages. On our marital union anniversary, I sent three questions to my wife. First, what are the things I was doing when we got married which I have stopped? Help me revive those if they will help our marriage. Two, what are the things I am doing now which I must stop because they will not build our marriage? And three, what are the things I have not even thought of but you consider them vital for our union? Please make those suggestions to me. I want to make amends. I want to live a life that is examinable, a life that is on track, a life that is on course. Many people are investing in their academics, in their career, but are not investing in their marriages. And marriages are falling apart with such great frightening speed that the Lord must give us the grace to go back to the place where we honor marriage. And he says marriage must be honored by all. Single or married, divorced or widowed. Everyone under the sound of my voice must honor marriage. There was a research that was done among 14,000 families and homes over a period of 25 years. And they tried to find out what made families strong. Because whilst we are looking at conflict, we must also look at what would make us strong. And they identified six things which I want to roll out to you, friends, brothers and sisters. This was Dr. Nick and Nancy Stinnett and Joe and Alice Beam. And they identify the following. First, strong families are dedicated and committed to the family as a group, promoting each other's welfare and happiness. Commitment, dedication to the cause of the family. I see people dedicated and committed to political parties and soccer teams than to families. And that must be changed. Some are more passionate about Moreno than they are about their wife. When they see Moreno on the screen, they get goosebumps all over. He sees his wife, nothing, there's no spark. And he doesn't see there's a shift of allegiance. You are, sh you, are, you are soon gradually going to render your wife redundant or your husband redundant. Secondly, they discover that they express a great deal of appreciation for each other. Do we appreciate our families? I always tell people, but for my wife, I would not have been called husband. When she came into my life, my designation changed to boy to man, man to husband. For my daughters, I would not have been called father. Of course, I've got people who are calling me father in the church. But my daughters, I must appreciate my daughters for making me become a father. I must also appreciate my dad and mom for making me a son. So, appreciation, do we appreciate? Thirdly, they have positive communication skills and spend amount of time with each other. How much time are we making today's stress of time? We are all under siege. I've made it a duty. Once a week, I eat with my girls. Just for them to know how to eat together with others. We're not learning these skills. We think it's nothing, but it's something. And we're having a Friday yam, and it was interesting. It's also an opportunity to teach them some manners. Seize the moment, parent. So they have these communication skills. And then they also actually spend time together, individually or as a group. The fifth one they found was that they were spiritually inclined. In other words, they took their spiritual development seriously. And finally, they had an ability to cope with stress, conflict, and crisis. And this is why this is important for us. In the book of Genesis, we read in Genesis chapter 3 from verse 12 and 13, in the English Standard Version of the Bible, it says, The man said, The woman whom you gave me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. 
Then the Lord said to the man, What is it that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me and I ate. Clear manifestation of conflict. When the divine conflict occurred, where man violated his relationship order with God, it affected his human relations. I always see a correlation between people's inclination towards God and how they treat human beings. And so when you find somebody declining in their relationship with mortals around them, check how he's standing with God. Check that one. If I'm numb towards the things of God, I'm surely going to be numb towards human beings. And treat them as though they don't exist. May God be gracious to us. Now you read further in chapter 4, verse 9 and 13. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel, your brother? Listen to his response. He retorted, literally. He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? The order has been distorted. And it started from the parents. It started with parents. That is why in the family setting, everything rises and falls with parents. Did you hear that? How many parents do we have in the church? I remember speaking in one international school. And a young lady, I was talking to them about the importance of preserving your sex life till you marry. And one young fellow stood up and said, is marriage necessary today? And she's only 16. I got interested in the subject that she had raised. I responded, of course, but I later wanted to meet her. And when I met her, she said to me, something happened at home. My proprietor gave me a book which I took home and I forgot to return it. So she asked her driver to send me back home. And when we got there, my dad, who actually left home way ahead of us, was back home because his vehicle was parked in the yard. And I quickly ran up, went to pick the book, and wanted to say hi to that. Apparently, his mother's best friend was in bed with the dad. She chanced upon both of them and screamed the father's name and walked out. That was not the first encounter she had. She had previously caught the mother kissing one of her father's best friends. Not kissing, not a hug, not a peg kiss what sometimes they call cunnilingus kissing for real and so those young girls beginning to re-examine the viability the essence the value the weight of marriage and this was a woman whenever their mom was away will come as a stopgap measure cooking for the children doing stuff and sure and this is the mother's best friend they go way back from school days such is common to families i listened to a radio conversation of a prophet releasing salvos against his own wife and describe her in words i cannot repeat and he was called a prophet one of my girls who works for an agency that monitors people's spouses in ghana here and she was hired to be on the same flight with somebody's husband as a stalker recording every move of this man and she checked into the same hotel this man checked in the woman was willing to buy an air ticket book an expensive hotel for this stalking young lady to monitor the movement of her husband mistrust i've read about children and young people smearing their parents on facebook I witnessed a case where a daughter snatched her own mother's husband. Own mother's husband. She moved the mother to the back house. And she and her father, biological father, were living in the main house. My question to you is that if you have a family, is your family a torture chamber or a tendering camp? Some families have become torture chamber. There is one ton abuse. Fathers sleeping with their own daughters. I work as a counselor. I've worked with young people the last 26 years. Sat very much close proximity with young people, sharing and pouring their hearts. I've sat with young ladies who say, I can't trust anything called man. I just can't. My most recent one was somebody who said, I can't trust a pastor. And I said, why? He said, I've dated two pastors. And they're all married men. They're heavily anointed. 
My best friend, two weeks before her wedding, the pastor had sex with her. And the pastor had the courage to bless the marriage. And now this young lady, whenever she's having any intimate encounter with her husband, she'll scream the pastor's name. Now that's how devastating these things can get. There are people who, if they were able to speak, will share deep things of their heart. The pain and the weight. And any time you drive by a tree that is grown and there are scars and lacerations on them, and some emit some liquid from the xylem, if the tree had a mouth, it would tell you its experience. And there are people with scars, emotional scars, psychological scars, inflicted upon them by people within the confines of the family, which is supposed to be an environment for tendering. We tender, we nurture, we grow, we groom, we make sure it becomes better. That has become for some a torture chamber. May God spare us. The nature of conflict. Have you ever had a conflict situation where you are sitting to resolve and it becomes more chaotic than your original intent? What is the nature of conflict? First, conflict is normal. It's normal. It's something that happens within our human society, within our environment. Secondly, it is a natural occurrence. Whenever there's tough war, people jostle for place and power, influence, values. All these things are part of it. It is also neutral. Don't blame the conflict on anybody. Conflict itself comes as a neutral entity. It is how you put the conflict situation to work that determines the outcome. And I found this beautiful quote by Bobby Conway. He says, I think a lot of people would rather jump out of a moving car than communicate and face reality. In 2 Samuel chapter 13, verse 21 and 22, from the English Standard Version of the Bible, we read the following words. When King David heard all these things, he was very angry. Very angry. One of my favorite subjects to teach is anger management skills. There are too many individuals who get angry and don't know what they do with their anger. One dickness of one of our congregations whose husband was not a believer and was a deep drunkard and would always get drunk and come behave in ways unimaginable amongst human beings. And this woman would stand there and insult this husband from head to toe in their local dialect. And the man grew hardened like a flint to the insult. You know, when somebody does something over a period of time, I fortunately went to Koforida Sektek and there, I mean, if guys got used to caning, they would just come 15, 20, just receive pa 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 he walks away. He shrugs off the everything. And then teachers will call, hey, come, come. Have you loaded? Say, no, no, nothing. Say, remove it. Now they want to hit it on your bare buttocks. And this man had also gotten used to the local language insults. And now the woman had to change to second gear. And so now she insults this husband in the local language. And now speaking tongues. Lay back. Tongues, oh, tongues, tongues. This one is tongues of fire, not tongues of redemption, not speaking mysteries, reigning abusive mystery. Now from the narrative which I heard from one of my apostles who is retired, Nobu Kwame Achu, he said that this man got used to the tongues as well. And now whenever this woman insults from the local language into the tongues, the man will just stand there and laugh. Now one day she insulted him using the local language, comes to the tongues, and the man was smiling and she said, We are Kramechrasi. <laughs> She's moving into interpretation. That's how horrible it can get. That's how horrible. One of my friends, she went to church. He was talking about reconciliation. He said he stood there on the platform and said, If anybody in the congregation has a problem with you, go and talk to them. And he saw a woman standing there crying, tears running down her cheeks. So he moved from the platform and went to her and said, Mom, may I help you? Is there something eating up? Who is causing you this pain? And she said, the one who is causing me the pain is sitting on the platform. My husband, he's an elder. Just before we got to church, he gave me terrible beatings and had the courage to come and lead worship. Now listen, brothers and sisters, let's not deceive ourselves. We can say for a long time to come, he who comes to God never lives the same. But I want it to be true with your life. Ask yourself, do you come to church and you live the same or you live different? The one who knows that you are a true Christian is your spouse, if you are married. Your husband or wife. The second testimony must be given by your children. One young man, he said, they say my father is an elder. They say my father is an elder. They say, 
Because he, he refuses to admit. Meanwhile, his father was a presiding elder. He was the lead elder amongst the elders. And yet the son was challenging his call and credentials as an elder. I'd gone somewhere to preach at Water Hall and I gave an example of a man I knew so well. Christian politician. I said, sisters, you know, some of you can be politicians. Look at this brother. Then one lady said, hey, elder, please come. The next time you come here, don't use him as an example. Otherwise, you have no message amongst the ladies. I said, really? She took me to the Water Hall car park. Those days on Legon campus, there was a yellow beetle and it was this man who was said to have bought for his girlfriend. The girl would never drive the car home and gave it to her boyfriend, a student, who would drive it around. When King David heard all these things, he was very angry. But Absalom spoke to Amnon, neither good nor bad. For Absalom hated Amnon because he had violated his sister Tamar. There are people who take a certain response to anger. Take a certain posture when it comes to conflict. And I'm mentioning a few of them. First, they deny or pretend it does exist. It looks so nice. They are the people who want to please the crowd. They don't want a pastor to know there is an issue between us as a couple. Otherwise, his position in church will be affected. Better go to the heart of the issue and get healing. Don't live in a state of denial. Because the longer it stays, the terrible it will stink. Our oh, beloved, all too soon our time is up. You've been listening to a conversation series titled Managing Family Conflict. And we want to keep in touch after this communication. And the number to keep in touch with us is 0244273368. 0244273368. This has been Pentecost R, sponsored by the Church of Pentecost Headquarters, La Accra. And your brother has been Amos Kevin Allen, Deputy Director the Church of Pentecost. We'll continue next time. Stay blessed.